Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. Back with us today after a short hiatus is our favorite geriatrician, Dr. Moochie. She's been busy working on producing a master class for healthcare professionals so she can share all of her knowledge and wisdom. So if you know somebody who might be interested in that, share the information. And we are talking about preventing dementia today, which is probably a good topic since I was almost ha- would have been half an hour late if I hadn't gotten a message. It's my brain <laughs> glitched this morning. So thanks for coming back today, Elena. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. It's so nice to see you again after all the summer holidays, because we haven't been online what, for two, three months. I've missed you. <laughs> yes, I know. I feel like everybody's lives have gotten so busy. My neuropsychologist friend is super busy. We just recorded last week and you've been super busy and I'm busy. <laughs> so it's like, yeah. Despite the fact that COVID is not gone from the globe, I guess everybody is doing their best to be back to normal or whatever normal is these days. <laughs> it's a new normal. That is true. It seems like every few years I come up with a new normal, but that's okay. I think having new challenges is good for your brain. And I don't know if you've had a chance to look at my Instagram stories, but we are house hunting. It is we're house hunting two hours away, which is a really big challenge. And I've never had I have seen your stories. Yeah, I have been following very, very carefully. Well, we should know next week after this recording, which this episode will come out. When this episode comes out, I'll know if we get this house or not. If it's meant to be, it will happen. If not, not in a rush. So we've never had a house hunt. Yes, thank you. We've never had a house hunt before. All the houses have found us. So this is new, new territory for us. But between me being late and some technical glitches, we're running late on the evening for Dr. Elena. So what do you suggest we do to help prevent dementia? Because I try to do everything I can, and I really hate it when I have brain glitches like I had today. <laughs> oh, Jenny, where do I start? Well, I, I think beforehand, before we talk about dementia prevention, it is so important for us um, non-medical, obviously, uh, majority of our listeners here are non-medical people, and to understand the types of dementia in a really simple terms, and once we understand that, then we can apply the research and the evidence we have in terms of dementia prevention to that information. Now, the main types of dementia which people will see in the Um, as a diagnosis when they take their loved ones to the doctors would be either Alzheimer's dementia or vascular dementia. So the Alzheimer's dementia is making 60 to 80 percent of all cases of dementia, whereas vascular dementia is about 15, 20 percent of cases. And then, of course, there are many other types such as Parkinson's disease dementia. Did you know, Jenny, that if you have had Parkinson's for 10 years or more uh, and you you survived uh, longer, earlier or later, you will develop dementia with Parkinson's. Then we have frontotemporal lobe dementia. There are many other, uh, Lewy body dementia, many other types which account for less than 10%. So Alzheimer's dementia, can you actually prevent it? Well, The simple answer is no, but there are things we can do. Bear with me, we can do. So the dementia, the Alzheimer's dementia, which accounts for majority of dementias itself, is divided into early onset dementia um, before the age of 65 usually, and it is to do with certain mutations which are responsible for the Alzheimer's disease. And there is not much you can do to prevent that. If it's meant to be, it's meant to be. And then, of course, we have late onset dementia, which is Alzheimer's dementia, which is after the age of 65. Where, uh, and it is, uh, the prevalence goes up with age. We know that uh, exponentially, the, uh, the older you are, the more your chance to get dementia. And I've got a few statistics in front of me here that uh, the patients over the age of 85, uh, almost one in four of us will get dementia if we survive beyond 85. So now, 
if we talk about the late onset dementia, there are a few things you can do, maybe not quite prevent it, but postpone it. Because if we look at it this way, uh, Jenny, let's say you are meant to develop Alzheimer's dementia, but you lead a really healthy life. Um, you, you control all your risk factors. You don't smoke. Um, you don't suffer from diabetes, obesity, all these problems. And you survive into all the age with healthy-ish brain without having strokes and heart attacks. And you are likely, if you are meant to develop Alzheimer's disease, you are likely to develop it much later in life. Whereas exactly the same individual, if they were uh, having unhealthy habits, especially the smoking and uh, high cholesterol, not controlling their blood pressure and so on and so forth, and they have had recurrent strokes, recurrent um, heart attacks and um, with that, they were aging through the disease becoming frail. These people are likely to develop their Alzheimer's disease earlier than the other group. Does that make sense? Yep. So we see a lot of diagnosis of vascular dementia given to people whose brain scans show mini strokes and uh, the transient ischemic attacks. In reality, knowing statistically that 60 to 80 percent of patients actually Alzheimer's dementia patients will find that on post-mortem studies when we examine their brains and find their pathognomonic features of Alzheimer's disease which are the neurofibular tangles and amyloid plaques um, so the people who are given diagnosis of vascular dementia they actually probably most likely have Alzheimer's disease but it came to light many, many years earlier than it would have done if they didn't have those stroke problems. Does that make sense, Jenny? I just want yeah, to make sure that it is understandable. <laughs> I, I didn't overcomplicate the explanation because it's so important our listeners understand this concept. A lot of people say, well, what's the po point of finding out whether I have dementia or not? There's not much you can do about it. Well, actually, there is. There is a lot you can do to, if not 100% prevent, but definitely postpone the onset of dementia by many, many years. Get it, push it into your late 80s rather than have it in your 60s and 70s. Definitely. <laughs> I'm all for that. That is yeah. why I exercise. I sleep well what else do i do try to control my stress last couple of, well last few years with mom and the pandemic that's been a little challenging but i'm working on it and just eating healthy and i've pretty much cured my sugar cravings excellent excellent i, I take neuro reserve and they did not they've never heard anybody say the sugar cravings went away but that was the only thing in my life that changed. And then once I got over the bad habit of just having a nighttime sweet, because that's what I'd always done. Now it's like, huh, I kind of miss it sometimes actually, but I know it's so much better for my brain not to be eating all that junk. And I was, I was good at controlling it, but now it's even better. So that was, that was kind of my last hurdle. Just need to lose yeah. a little bit of weight at this point. So I'm trying. Good. Good planning. And you've raised quite a few interesting points there. So I'm coming to the point, actually, what can you do to push the onset of inevitable, shall we say, dementia, maybe postpone it by 10, 15, 20 years? Uh, well, controlling those risk factors. So plenty of research. So I will divide into these preventative measures into social factors and medical factors. So if the medical factors are very well known to everyone, if uh, it's not smoking, controlling your blood pressure, controlling your blood sugars, avoiding those strokes and heart attacks, um, uh, keeping blood pressure well controlled, there is plenty of evidence showing that keeping it under 130 over 70 or even 120 over 70 in younger age is 
so beneficial to you. I, I feel sometimes we are not doing enough to treat the blood pressure in younger individuals. As a geriatrician, I do the opposite in frail elderly patients. You see in frail, all the people controlling the blood pressure too tightly can lead to falls and fractures. And we discussed this in the past. Whereas in younger people, my God, with my youngest stroke patients, I'm also a stroke consultant. I really get that blood pressure under control. 120 over 70 is the target which we go for. Um, smoking, stopping smoking is never late at any age. I'd like to make that really, really clear. Alcohol in moderation and obviously normal weight, controlling your cholesterol. Now that's another important point. You might be of absolutely normal weight, eat perfectly healthy diet and your cholesterol still can be very high. We call it familial hypercholesterolemia. It runs in the families. So if you are someone out there uh, who have a family member, mom or dad or granddad who had a heart attack or stroke at younger age in their 50s, 60s, you must go and get yourself checked. Check your cholesterol, have the well man's and well woman's check. Cholesterol, blood pressure, blood sugar levels. So get yourself checked, checked if there is a family member having a heart attack or stroke at younger age. Um, so these are medical risk factors. Is there anything I missed, Jenny? I don't think so, but I have a very good story about the familial cholesterol issue. Back yeah. in the old, old days when I used to go to a gym, we had a trainer who had been, she was an athlete all her life, very trim, shape, you know, just in excellent shape physically, she was traveling to Mexico with her family. She woke up with um, a headache and her arms hurt mm -hmm. or she went to bed that way. And she, her husband thankfully gave her aspirin because her, her cholesterol was through the roof and she had a heart attack in her forties. And yeah. she was very embarrassed over that fact for a long time because she was, I mean, more, most people would not have survived what she did. That is how healthy she was. And then mm -hmm. she got over the embarrassment of being so fit and healthy and a, you know, a professional, you know, physical trainer. And then she started telling this story, which is important because you would never expect her to have something like that. And it, and she has to take medication to control it because her body produces the cholesterol. There's, it's, it has nothing to do with anything that she does. It's just her life. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's so important to point that out. Uh, the reason being is, of course, young, younger people who do lead healthy lifestyles, they wouldn't know if there is anything wrong with them until that fateful day comes and they have a stroke and heart attack. So, yeah, check, checking out uh, worse while doing it. Actually, I see even though I'm a geriatrician, I do see in my clinic a lot of 50 plus year olds, um, all geriatricians are general physicians as well. So I see a lot of 50 plus year olds coming for their um, whole top to toe examination, blood test and just getting that MOT, we call it in England. Um, in terms of social factors, so uh, what research we have out there? Quite, quite a few um, uh, research papers I looked into, uh, looking into social isolation. So it's one of the factors which um, contributes to dementia and worsening dementia and uh, social isolation causes depression. And of course, mental health illness is a risk factor for dementia as well. Depression and dementia go hand in hand. Um, and it is, we realize what a major issue social isolation is in the pandemic when suddenly um, thousands, hundreds of thousands of people were cut out of the, uh, cut off the world. And especially my, the generation I look uh, after, they were not prepared for this. They were not trained to use WhatsApp and uh, YouTubes and things like that. And uh, so, uh, and I'm now seeing the effect of social isolation, Jenny, I see so many people brought to my clinic where family is wondering whether mom or dad are going a bit demented, 
but actually you look into them, you do evaluation and they are profoundly depressed or suffering from anxiety disorder, all as a result of pandemic induced isolation and loneliness and deconditioning. So there is that factor, uh, whether it's before pandemic, now it's particularly important to talk about is social isolation. You need to remember about widows when you lose your spouse as well, that that can lead to profound loneliness and uh, within a year or so the family might find that mom's memory is not that perfect anymore. So some other factors to mention. Um, one a research uh, paper showed that people who retire later have later have less chance of developing dementia. So work longer, you will be fitter, frailer, uh, less frail and more sharp. So retiring later helps. And of course, things like exercise, going out in fresh air, um, no doubt contributes to you know, a healthy brain and postpones the onset of dementia. And the other interesting one is mental activity. Now, none of this is rocket science, right? Uh, but it's, it's important to point these things out. Mental activity, um, which showed the preventative qualities in terms of preventing dementia, we are not talking about reading a book or doing a puzzle. In this paper, it was actually a proper mental bombardment where we are advocating people to do something which will really stimulate your brain like, like going to university if you were a young person. So what I advise during my well-man checks is if I am seeing someone in their 50s and they ask, well, doctor, what can I do to prevent dementia? I say mental activity and then say, well, we are mentally active. We are on the internet, we are doing our jobs. No, that's not enough. Mental activity, go out there and think of doing another degree. Maybe <laughs> evening studies, get a new skill, study a new language. And for me, for example, I'm 45 and I'm, I'm doing my master class. And if you looked at my website, Jenny, it's got 10 modules, 30 lectures covering various aspects of geriatric medicine. The amount of reading um, and studying I'm doing, it's just incredible. I have no evenings, no weekends. And, and, and yes, on one hand, I'm thinking this is crazy. Um, it's, it's hard work. What am I doing in my mid forties? On the other hand, I'm thinking, I'm actually slowing down postponing my dementia. It's a, this type of activity your brain needs in your mid age, middle ages, in your uh, sort of 40, 50s, 60s, to uh, prevent or postpone the onset of dementia if you are meant to develop one. That's interesting. I have not learned new skills on the scale of like a university degree, but I'm always learning new things with my hobby. So I like to make cards and I watch mm. YouTube videos and then I, I do what they're doing. And it's, I'm a super visual person for those who don't remember that I was a photographer and watching the videos, you think, oh, that looks easy. And then you start to do it and you're like, oh, wait, I got to think about this. And so I've just recently done something that was new and different and it was I got such a feeling of accomplishment, even though it's just, it's, I don't want to say it's silly. It was very joyful, but I guess now I'm going to have to go back to learning French, <laughs> but I, I wanted to point out one thing when you were talking about the social isolation, I think I said that right. Like I said, my brain's trying to glitch today. One of the reasons that we are house hunting where we are is our best friends are threatening to move up there. We, we make the joke that, you know, they decided to do this and we're doing it, but the, where we're looking is a very large development that is, I'm not sure how to translate it into England, but it's a gated community. So it's like a yeah. closed neighborhood and they have a lake and a golf course and, you know, dance classes, craft club. You can sign up for a golf time and they'll add three people to your tea time so that you meet new people. There are so many activities. I think we would exhaust ourselves. So we are ready. <laughs> we are very ready 
to start this new life. And we've, we looked at some other places that were outside this development. And I'm like, I could be very happy here. It's quiet. There's trees, you know, mm-hmm. I think it's becoming quite obvious. I don't like the fact that my neighbors are loud and noisy and right on top of me. So I'm looking forward to not having that. But I also knew that in some of these places we were looking at finding, you know, social groups that resonate with my life, like the crafting and the, Mm -hmm. I'm not golfing, but I might. Um, And the dance classes, you know, those would be much harder to do. They would cost more money. They would take more effort. And so we're, we're looking for kind of a whole different lifestyle at this point. So that's, that's actually why we're, why we're going where we're going that plus, you know, real estate in California is just phenomenally expensive. And even though we have a very healthy budget, it doesn't buy what I want in the city that we live in now. And it almost buys what I want up there. This is Mm -hmm. in the foothills of California. So, you know, it's, (laughs) it's scary, but I think it's going to be good when it happens. And you guys just have to watch the social media to see when it happens. (laughs) Oh, yes, um, I will follow closely. Of course, as you've been describing your experience, immediately I'm thinking, how can we translate it into an advice to our listeners? And what is amazing from what you are telling me is now, Jenny, uh, how old are you, if you don't mind telling our listeners? I will be 55 on November 17th. So I think that's after this episode is supposed to, I know it's after this episode comes out, but not far. Not far. So you are 55. You are very healthy, independent, extremely active. However, you are already thinking about the future and being within the community where if something happens to you or if something happens to your husband, there will be a support around you and you will not be lonely. Now, how often do I see people finding in their late 70s, 80s, or even 90s living in the same house in a remote village in a medieval dark building with low ceilings? And I go and see these people um, on my home visits. No wonder they have sleep problems, Jenny, because they're sitting in the dark houses whole day long, napping and sleeping, and then they can't sleep at night. And poor sleep, of course, makes you, contributes to the memory troubles as well. And my first question is, 20 years ago, you knew you will be sick 80. Now, you didn't become 80 overnight. Why did you stay in this house, in this remote village, and now you can't drive, and you are completely socially isolated from everyone. Your family has grown up, and they are living God knows where, one in Australia, another one in America. Your (laughs) grandchildren are busy at universities, and your husband died, and you are all lonely here in this medieval house, in this village, and not not even neighbors, just surrounded by the fields. You know, it's it's good to start preparing for that avoiding isolation. We're talking about the how to avoid social isolation. Think about where you want to be, whether you like people. I mean, there are some people who just don't want people, don't like people, but it's good to prepare for that later life and avoiding self um, social isolation in your mid 50s 60s you really have to do that move and you see if people delay that then it becomes too stressful so i have i've been looking after a gentleman a very prominent lawyer barrister for the last 10 years or so and he's now in his mid 80s and for the last five years at least i've been telling him move move, move. And he was resistant. He continued living in his whatever 13 bedroom uh, mansion. And it wasn't until he started falling downstairs that he at last uh, went ahead and uh, he sold and he moved into a really nice retirement complex here in Kent. And he's so much happier. And, and, and of course, what does, uh, did he say? He said, I wish I listened to you earlier because <laughs> having this enormous move in my mid 80s, it was so stressful. I was so fitter and stronger five years ago. I wish I listened to you then. So my advice to, the, uh, to all our listeners here, 
don't be stubborn guys <laughs> we will all get uh old and you know you, you we will get into our, our 80s as well hopefully we'll live into our 80s and 90s it's good to be in a nice community be surrounded by friends neighbors have that support whenever you need so do what jenny is doing well done jenny <laughs> thank you well what's nice is this is not an age restricted community so there are young families there are elderly people and everybody in between i'm assuming i haven't seen a lot of variety of ages well we've mm -hmm. only been up there basically twice three times but once we weren't actually looking at homes and one of the things that i advocate for strongly is to change the narrative on moving to an assisted living community in our older years i'm not there yet and I'm, I have made success with my husband. This is my opinion. The community my mom lived in, now she was in memory care, but it was also part of an assisted living community. They had fantastic food, portion controlled for less active, older adults. Not always quite enough food for me, but you know, I could throw in some <laughs> extra fruit and would be fine. Sodium controlled. I was shocked that you never wanted to, you know, add salt to the meals and just very, very tasty and variety. You also have somebody who is worrying, you know, so you've got somebody cooking for you. You've got somebody maintaining the building. You have somebody maintaining the yard. You have somebody planning activities. You've got people there. Like, and if you're 85, why the heck would you not want somebody else to take care of this stuff? So you can get up and decide what you're going to do today. I'm going to walk the dog. I'm going to go play cards with these ladies. I'm going to go golf with these men or whatever it is that you like to do. And because this city is two hours away from us, we're using my, you know, my husband's a real estate broker. We're using a broker up there. There's a lot of reasons for it. it makes life easier to start with. But my husband made the comment, this will probably be our last house until we moved to assisted living. And when I heard him say that, I was like, yes, I have, I have convinced one person, <laughs> the most yeah. important person, because that's, I think it's generational, you know, like mm -hmm. my mom always said, I don't want to be a burden to you girls, but I want to live in my home forever. Mm -hmm. Those were mm -hmm. mutually exclusive. And, yeah. you know, she was in a traditional neighborhood with families and older people but not, there was no social activities attached to the, where they lived. You would have to search out, you know, go outside your home and your neighborhood to get those. So, you know, I, I feel like we're on the right path and, and moving to a whole new location. Like I have lived in the same County my entire life. So 55 mm -hmm. years. So it's a little bit, it's a little bit hard to say I live in the foothills of Southern or Southern California. I must need better food today. <laughs> I live in the foothills of California versus I live in the San Francisco Bay area. It's going to be a very strange change, but it's a positive change. And, you know, again, we are um, leaning out our possessions again, so that it's easier to move. And it's, there'll be a lot of like, We'll have to discover new restaurants, new shops, new places to ride our bike. I won't have to find new places to walk the dogs because this place has a beautiful dog park with a lake for the dogs. They dredged it and cleaned it out. So it's perfect for the puppies. And I'm going to have a wet dog for the rest of her life <laughs> once we move up there. <laughs> so it's like even the dogs are going to get a better life. <laughs> So it's going to be interesting. I hope it's all, it, it's going to be all positive. I have to say yeah. it that way. Yeah, that, that's an attitude I'd like to hear. <laughs> not that's one I good. used to have when I was younger. It's, and you know, this house is not perfect. Our budget doesn't extend to perfect, but I'm, I'm coming around to the quote flaws and seeing their potential versus I hope these flaws don't bother me. So my mind is shifting, which is a good thing. But I also told my husband, that means we probably won't get it because now I'm like, OK, I'm thinking of all the positive things. But as my mom said, if it's meant to be, it will happen. And we have a contract so as, on this house till 
July. So we're mm-hmm. not in a hurry. I mean, we are, yeah. but not. <laughs> mm-hmm. We don't have so, to live. Now, the assisted living, the idea of assisted living is very, very popular in the United States. And it, it has started developing here in England as well. We have quite a few assisted living uh, places. Uh, the care homes, of course, they are good ones, not so good ones. And I agree with you. It's very generational. And to this day, there a lot of older people are adamant. Uh, they don't want to go into a care home environment and they get their... Uh, children to give them a pledge you will never put me into care home and of course when the time comes um, the children are busy with their own lives they can't take full care of mom or dad and and there is no one to look after them at home and the first thing they say well we gave mom a promise never to put her into the home but what can we do and as a result, people end up in hospitals. Or now, of course, hospitals make their memory concerns worse. They pick up hospital-acquired infections. And in England here, sometimes they're stuck in hospital for weeks while we're looking for alternative accommodation. And thinking that all of this could have been prevented with um, advanced care planning, like really planning for your older age, um, thinking where you want to be and uh, talking about how to prevent dementia. I mean, one of the obvious ways to prevent dementia is look after your mental health as well, avoid isolation, avoid anxieties of, uh, and avoid depression. So that that's a big thing. I, I think we've concentrated a lot uh, on avoiding social isolation. And I, I don't regret that because it does play a huge, huge role without proper planning, People are caught in crisis, end up in hospital. And I'm sorry to say, Jenny, many people do not live in hospital because there, there is this um, false assumption that hospital is a safe place. It is not. The hospitals are there to treat acute illness for two, three days, you are out. But when people are caught in the middle of social crisis and bring their loved ones to hospital, um, you can't find a worse place to bring your elderly, frail mom or dad. Things will only get worse from then on. So yes, advanced preparation, ladies and gentlemen out there, uh, for your parents, aging parents, and actually for yourself as well, when when you come to that age. Um, even myself, I'm already thinking, my husband and I, we are thinking what, what where we want to be and what we are going to do. Um, uh, when, when the time comes and we will start planning in our mid 50s, 60s, definitely. So well, it uh, creeps up coming, on you. Yeah. Coming back to the subject of uh, preventing uh, dementia, I'd like to maybe come back to some of the medical stuff as well as we're, we're talking, things are going through my mind. I didn't stop on diabetes long enough, I feel, Jenny. And a lot of people get diabetes, type 1 diabetes you can get as a child. And controlling your blood sugar throughout your life is so important to avoid the damage to the blood vessels of the brain and avoid those strokes and avoid prevent dementia. Now, when we're, they, when we're talking about aging with diabetes, there comes the other spectrum. When we are asking for really tight control of diabetes as a younger adult to, look, uh, to avoid the strokes, as an older adult, the very tight control of diabetes can in fact lead to recurrent hypoglycemic attacks. Hmm. So in all the people, as you age with your diabetes, we kind of re- relax the diabetes control a little bit because very tight diabetes, controlled diabetes is a surrogate mar- marker, could be a surrogate marker for recurrent hypoglycemic attacks. And of course, all the people don't come to hospital saying, oh, doctor, I, I've got a hypo, I'm shaky, I'm sweaty, I feel hungry. No. They come with confusion, with a fall, disorientated, and um, it can actually bring on dementia or even exacerbate. If you have recurrent hypoglycemic attacks, it can stop dementia. Or if you have existing memory concerns, um, it can make them much worse. So I just thought I'll get the diabetes uh, question out there in terms of prevention of dementia. Yep. That's another concern for me. Cause that was, my dad had diabetes. 
most of the men on my dad's side of the family have been or, or are diabetic. And that's how I started on my weight loss journey a dozen years ago, because I didn't want to become diabetic because I really liked, liked past tense sugar. And then I learned that losing the weight and exercising and all the stuff I did to prevent diabetes also may help prevent dementia. So twofold mm. was very, very beneficial. What I'm hearing in a very basic way is the better you take care of yourself in your younger and middle ages, the less strict you have to be when you get to your, maybe your eighties, late eighties, mid to late eighties with your um, blood pressure medicines and your blood sugar. So, you know, be good now and you can quasi retire from some of that strict focus on your medications and stuff later oh in definitely definitely <laughs> i think you and i yeah no you you've got it 100 percent right jenny we have discussed this before de-prescribing is a huge subject on its own and uh, i have a whole module within my master class on de-prescribing and it is becoming huge in geriatric medicine where, yes, in fact, we control blood sugars, diabetes, uh, cholesterol levels real tight in younger people to make them old, to live, to get them to live, to reach their old age. But when they've done so, we relax the treatments because the very tight, continuing with very tight control in your 80s and 90s can in fact have detrimental effect on your health. And as I mentioned, again, bringing dementia into the picture, if your blood pressure is, blood pressure control is not relaxed and you are very tightly controlled, you are at risk of developing dizzy spells and falls. You fall, you fracture your hip. You fracture your hip, you need a, to have a surgery under general anesthetic. And what general anesthetic does to your brain? It can, initiate, it can precipitate dementia, it can make existing dementia worse, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we just discussed that the relaxing the tight diabetes control. The same goes about cholesterol, the statins, which we're using in younger people. I spend my lifetime crossing them all uh, of the drug charts of all the adults because guess what? Statins have a lot of drug interactions. And as all the adults, we're more likely to accumulate loads of tablets. So the likelihood of interactions is higher and the statins can cause muscle aches and pains and problems and people start falling. So um, yeah, it's it's definitely, you, you got it 100% right. Behave okay. yourself, take your medicines, keep your blood sugars, cholesterol uh, and uh, the blood pressure under tight control but review your medicines when you get into your 70s and 80s and relax the controls a little bit to keep safe, to keep safe in later life. That sounds wonderful. I'm, I seriously am never going to take a prescription until I've talked to you. <laughs> you had a um, case that you presented on Instagram, and I, I don't remember all the terms properly, but a gentleman had a very adverse reaction because of his uh, blood thinners, just warfarin, which my husband was on. He is on the newer stuff that's not quite as um, harsh on your system as warfarin. But when I yeah. saw that, I was like, ah, now I know I should probably pay attention if he has any of these things that she presented. <laughs> So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I uh, it, you know, I do case of the week on Instagram and there are so many cases I've accumulated and I don't even have to go into my past. I just have to go on a board round to get one of the cases and uh, get out there and um, uh, do a little bit of teaching. So there is so much material out there. I love sharing. It's so, so important. I mean, I call myself a, a common sense advisor, really. I, I believe a lot what we've said today is it really is not rocket science and it's common sense but at times people need that little bit of push and also Jenny I talk a lot you know 50% of my time as a geriatrician I spend talking and talking to the families I feel sometimes there is that 
not embarrassment, but how shall I put it? Children just can't bring themselves to talk to their moms and dads about certain subjects. And they do need that middle person, the doctor, to actually discuss the elephant in the room, if you want, to bring up the subject. And I'll give you a very recent example where uh, the daughter brought my mom to my clinic thinking that mom is uh, has dementia and I did the test test proved that there is no dementia and diagnosis is that she is suffering from generalized anxiety disorder and the daughter was almost arguing with me saying no she's got dementia she has all the symptoms of dementia and I said look I've, I've spoken to your mom about this and that and that and did you know your grandma had a major mental health breakdown? And that's a risk factor. If your parent has a major mental health breakdown and mental illness, you are likely, you have a high risk of going through the same in your later life as well. And can you believe it? She never knew her grandma had a major mental health breakdown. Her mom never told her about that part of her history. Her mom never shared with her the anxieties she's been experiencing, being embarrassed to look weak. So here you go. There is a, a, a daughter and mom seemingly very loving, very close. Both want to help each other, but not talking to each other. So you need, as I, I keep saying, what we're talking about is common sense, but sometimes you need that healthcare professional to initiate the conversation. That makes sense. And I think slowly we're removing the stigma from mental health issues, including Alzheimer's and dementias, which help because, you know, like my mom denied that she had the problem early on. And then I don't know if she just didn't know she had the problem anymore. The, you don't know what you don't know. It's Agnes, Agnes, I think they pronounced that right. Um, you know, and then, you know, it's like the last couple of years have been rough. You know, I lost my mom. I lost the dog. I lost my paternal grandmother. I changed mm -hmm. careers. We moved houses. Now we're moving again. There's been a lot of, uh, you know, changes. Mm -hmm. And there are times when you just kind of feel like the gray cloud is sitting on your head. And it's, it's better to say, this is how I feel today. And then maybe your spouse or your family can just they can help they they can do things that won't make it worse or poke the bear and make you angry and now you're angry and upset about things like i've learned it's much better to just say man i'm really feeling kind of blue today i'm not sure why or you know i'm just sometimes it's like i'm really stressed and i don't know why okay. like we were when we were looking at the houses i'm like why am i nervous it's not a life or death choice and i've learned that we make very few life or death choices. We just think we make them, you know, most choices are not life or death. So mm, it's just, mm. it, I really hope that we're that like conversations we're having and other people are having that we, we change the dynamic of talking about some of these things, because I have learned so much from you and past guests about dementia and caregiving that it's like, if I'm learning new things, other people are learning new things. And I just think that's, very beneficial. We should just talk. It's good for our brains to have conversations yeah. too. <laughs> <laughs> so is there a last thing? So we want to make sure our, our blood, blood work is good, that we sleep well, eat well, and find some friends to do some fun things with. That sounds like a prescription for living as well as possible for as long as possible. And start learning foreign language. <laughs> I yes I I was one of those dumb kids. I live in California, which is actually a majority of Hispanic, but I didn't want to learn Spanish because everybody's learning Spanish. So I took French, and there's nobody around me to speak French. So now I have to relearn that, which I want to do because we would like to travel to France sometime very soon. But I also have housekeepers that speak Spanish, and they don't speak English very well. And sometimes we have miscommunication. So it'd be smart to learn that. So maybe I should just yes. learn both at once. <laughs> <laughs> Go for it, Jenny. <laughs> what the heck? Well, you know, 
I'm going to have some drives back and forth to the new place soon, hopefully, and coming back here for the gal that takes care of my hair. So I'll have some time to learn some new languages. So that will be on my 2022 bucket list. Excellent. Awesome. Well, I hope we've given people some excellent things to think about, things to take to their doctor so that all of us can live to be 103 like my grandmother did and her mind was her mind was fine until about 102 and then she started having I think many strokes. So if you can get to 102, your mind is good. That's a good goal. Absolutely. And finally, Jenny, I just wanted to mention with the masterclass, or although it is for healthcare professionals, it is for healthcare professionals of any background, it, doctors, nurses, pharmacists, but there are quite a few modules where non-healthcare professionals will find uh, very useful as well. And uh, you can see, dear listeners, the way I explain things, I explain medical things in the same manner. And uh, one of the modules, for example, frailty, there is a module on dementia and delirium. Yes, there are medical aspects, of course, to these modules, but they're explained in a way which might make a lot of sense for you and answer a lot of your questions. So um, please join in if you wish i it, it's priced so low i've uh, priced it so low for that so people can just join and listen to one or two lectures even if you don't want to do the whole master class of 30 lectures you might just uh, choose and pick whatever you want to listen to well you'll be able to find the link for that in the show notes i have links to other stuff for dr elena in my instagram bio so it's very easy to find her if you're not already following her, please do that. And we will get together probably again after the first of the year because you're busy. I'm busy. I swear I don't know which direction my life's going right now, but that's okay. It's just a whole new journey of exploration to, to go on. So I Absolutely. appreciate this today. Sorry Thank I was you. late. We'll go have no. some. I had a healthy breakfast. I don't know. Too many things going on. My brain is trying to remember too many things I needed to look at my calendar at breakfast this morning instead of relying on my brain. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate it and good luck with the master class and we'll get together soon. Thank you, Jenny. Bye-bye, everyone. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your favorite podcasts.